In that case, I'll delay no longer. I'll hand over to Erica uh, and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you. Um, what was it that somebody said about, I hope there's no environmentalists here today in the last talk. Uh, unlucky digital catapults, I'm afraid. Um, and also, just a few things to say before I kind of get into things. Don't worry by the title. I'm not going to say, don't make things. Hopefully it will come out. There's lots of different ways to make things and focus off what things you make as well. Uh, the other thing to say is that I'm not a things expert in any way or form, I would say. And so I'm quite intimidated here today with all of those hands that went up early about being a developer and all of these kind of areas like that. But what I think is important is this kind of diversity, mixing of different perspectives, um, and that's where innovation happens, and that's what I really care about, making things happen. I'm actually a product design engineer, so actually I do have a little bit of uh, <laughs> insight into this area. I started off life originally uh, in my career in the Netherlands, uh, working for Philips, uh, doing a lots of different product design, uh, consumer electronics devices, vacuum cleaners, kettles, kitchen appliances, all of these things, but also looking at their roadmaps of what's coming next. And I, th I think those types of areas, when we look at the smart connected home, were already beginning to you know, pop up about eight, 10 years ago. I then got really interested in kind of creating change. So when you want to create change and sustainability, the consumers and behavior is a huge part, as well as policy. So actually, I moved to London and I worked in an NGO, so campaigning, creating policies, doing lots around waste recycling, uh, litter around that area, before, for the last five years, working as technical nature, really blending these all together. And where I see a lot of innovation happening around sustainability, sustainable design, also the, the kind of the things network is around I suppose the startup area, where you have that opportunity to kind of disrupt from the beginning as you go. I co-founded an organization also, I'm into open source, <laughs> called Open Source Circular Economy Days. So that was really looking at the role also of the open source movement, that kind of ecosystem, the way of doing things more open collaboratively, and its potential for sustainability as well. So I'm going to kind of touch on a lot of these things today. And when I say sustainability, I think we talked a lot about it, and I heard it in some of the talks earlier, that kind of longevity, how do you actually make a business last and, and stay alive, really, which is really important. But I suppose the other side of it is that kind of the social, the ethical, the environmental considerations, like what's the point of the business and how does it contribute to this or take these into account. I always say that if you do take these into account, your business will be more likely to be sustainable in the long-term sense as well. And when I say designer, I think that can be so many different things, engineer, architect, scientist, developer, um, but it's all really more about that kind of mindset of kind of thinking about a problem, finding out more about it, defining you know, what is that issue you're going to be working on, and then creating, ideating solutions around that. Testing, prototyping, and then eventually hoping getting to the market as well. So I think probably everyone in this room is a designer in some form. And the other thing is to say that I'm inspired uh, by nature. We heard the word ecosystem before. I think, you know, IoT, it's not a single device, it's a kind of an ecosystem, a connected platform. And something that does this really well is nature. Um, there's a whole area of design called biomimicry that is absolutely fascinating, where you look to see how nature does things, from the wood, wild, wood wide web, which is this interconnected system that we're learning around trees and how they talk to get each other as well. So I think that's a huge area that's just growing and we're only beginning to learn more about. The other side is that I love, I love stuff, <laughs> but uh, I love the stories behind it. Uh, this stool is um, it's 110 years old. It was made by my great-grandmother's brother when he was an apprentice when he was 13 and had to make this stool. I recently inherited it. So for me, when I talk about design, durability, usefulness, something that lasts, I think you know, there's lots of great examples around us when we look at that. And, and how can we take some of those design considerations into some of the fast technology that we're making now? And I worry. <laughs> I think the world's a, a quite worrying place 
uh, right now and, and lots of different things uh, going on. Uh, we've had the 20 warmest years on record in the last 22 years, uh, with 2015 and 18 making up the, you know, the hottest as well. Has anyone seen these stripes before? Are you from Reading? Yes, exactly. So actually, these are the climate warming stripes developed by Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading, which actually have kind of started to get more famous now. They've ended up on The Economist, actually, uh, just the, the latest issue as well. And that's really using data visualization to show oh, that since we started recording temperature, like where we are now. So data recording these types of things from the climate to other things is a powerful tool in engaging citizens, uh, governments, and things, to begin to hopefully act. We've also seen deforestation in the Amazon as the worst in turn years. Uh, satellites flying over that are seeing huge amounts of um, uh, well, forests being cleared at a time that we know we need to be planting more trees than ever before. 10,000 species are estimated to go extinct every year, a man-made biodiversity disaster happening. And when we get to our food chain, we know that about a third of it that was produced is wasted. So that's, that's a huge amount of waste when we know that some, uh, some people, some countries are also facing famine or food poverty. It might be in the, you know, the farming stage as well, or further down the supply chain in the home. Loads of different issues to contend with. And then once we get to plastic, which has been making all the headlines, I suppose, at the moment, uh, we know that only 14% of plastic packaging is recycled globally, and with about 8 million tonnes leaking into the ocean every year. Now, moving maybe closer, closer to home, into the electronics uh, field, uh, there's a lot of e-waste uh, being produced every year, and only 20% of this getting recycled formally. Uh, Who's got a mobile phone in this room? I expect that'd be a... Who's got maybe one or two mobile phones in a drawer at home? Quite a few as well. Oh, <laughs> quite a few as well. And, and now, who's maybe got some, some things or devices maybe in a drawer at home? Okay, yep, yep. Quite a few of those. So, so all of these electronics are kind of sitting there unused. Um, if you put 42 mobile phones together, if we club together all of those ones in the drawer, we'd get about a one gram of gold from that. To get one gram of gold <laughs> from, from you know, resource extraction, you need about a ton of the ore as well. So I think we've got a lot of resources and lots of electronics all over the place that are maybe not being used to their full potential. So this is a very technical graph, uh, I thought I'd put this one in, that over time, we're, you know, we're really getting into quite a difficult situation um, at the moment. And if anyone's read the book Sapiens, I think it gives a really good perspective of, of kind of what is humanity, where have we come from, and where are we going? I've not read Homo Deus yet, and I think that one goes into more the tech side, but I quite like this quote when you kind of step back and our once green and blue planet is becoming a concrete and plastic shopping centre. So stuff, things, products, consumption is kind of fueling uh, a lot of these issues that we're facing. But I like to look on the positive side. Um, these are kind of big problems, but it also means that they're big challenges that we need to solve. And I think that's where there's a huge role in the Internet of Things uh, to play a part. Just a few of the examples that uh, Vinka, Vinka, Vinka? <laughs> uh, talked about earlier as well. And we've got a huge movement of, uh, of young, young students, uh, next generation asking for it, as well as right now, rebellions happening around the world, calling for governments, businesses to switch and think about these different challenges and issues um, to take forward as well. And there's actually a framework there, the UN Sustainability Goals, which are 17 different goals covering from uh, renewable, clean energy, to responsible production, life on land, life under the sea, and these have been set out with different key challenges to be uh, focused on and, and move forward to actually get to where we want to go. So when we think about design, and, and I think we talked about the, the, the hardware book earlier, the prototype production, um, at university I like, learned about DFM, Design for Manufacturing, but actually, when we're facing all of these different challenges and problems, you kind of almost have to look much further ahead and think, well, what are we designing for? 
and I say we have to design for life. And to do that, we need to collaborate. We need to bring policy together, products and people better than ever before to really kind of combine different insights and experiences um, to really solve some of these different challenges, which I think that example earlier from Microsoft working with the, uh, the council is, is a nice example, making sure that, that all the different stakeholders are involved. And we need to get to the root of the problem. If you're an engineer, you go, why, why, why? And sometimes we're solving like these little, little fake problems at the top of the iceberg, whether actually we need to go much further into kind of what, what are some of the issues. I think a lot around the smart cities, there's that kind of, are we designing to, to mitigate or adapt? Just taking the example of, say, air pollution, you know, the, the, the data is a great tool or sensors around the air that can either be used to, to think about how to redesign a street to, to kind of change it so it cleans the air, or is it also about me when I'm cycling my bike that I know the dirty hotspots that I need to wear my mask to kind of mitigate some of those issues as well. So I think there's this really interesting role of the kind of mitigation and adaption technology. Uh, the Reading Climate Strategy is just right now writing its kind of mitigation, but also an adaption strategy because you know, we are facing a lot of these challenges already. One of the other things I say to do as a designer is, is to see where your products um, end up. I've been to a lot of recycling facilities. I get quite excited about them. But also, I've been to some waste dumps, and I've also seen different places where, particularly, say, in Philips, some of the electronics, you know, you see these uh, reports on the TV, and, and where is actually some of the things that we're making, sometimes on a mass scale, ending up? And actually, how can we, how can we design it better to try and make sure that all of this, this e-waste or, or other technology isn't ending up um, where it shouldn't be. Um, what, what I suppose a lot of that and the basis of that is our, our kind of economy at the moment. This kind of extraction, manufacture, retail, user, waste. And quite often we only kind of see a little bit of it. Perhaps if you're a manufacturer or a designer, you'll, know, you'll see that to the retail or potentially a little bit of the extraction. But I think this is this interesting part right now that for a long time the user the citizen, consumer, didn't really see any of that, what was behind the scenes. But now, actually, with digital technology, um, it's harder, <laughs> harder perhaps to hide, or, or it's easier for um, them to really see how stuff is made and begin to question and connect where it is being made in the first place. Um, I think this is a really ex great example that came on the market more recently of, of kind of our disposable society. It's a phone, one-time phone charger. Uh, so you plug it in, charge your phone for two hours, and then chuck it away. They'll probably say, you know, dispose of responsibly. But I think a really good rule of thumb is anything smaller than a, like a vacuum cleaner, or if it fits in your bin, it's probably going to go there as well. So a lot of that we design and make can be overly packaged, disposable, breaks too fast, can't be fixed. And, and I suppose this term's been around for a while planned obsolescence, since it was kind of coined in the 1970s. Um, and we know that technology, it develops, it moves, it's going faster than ever. It can, it becomes obsolete quite fast. So I asked, <laughs> when I was getting into my things, uh, things talk, like, just, just what is a thing? So actually, I think a lot of people, particularly about internet things, thinks it's floating in a cloud somewhere. It's, you know, it's, it's not actually a physical device as such. Um, but then when you break it down, and, and I've done a lot of this in the past, doing like kind of life cycle analysis and teardowns to understand how stuff is built and what's in it. You know, it, it is a collection of PCBs, sensors, power sources, wires, displays, housing, fastenings, and all of these things are made of materials, stuff, resources, and quite often those rare earth metals, minerals, you know, coming from the far, far side of the world and extracted as well. So, it's really interesting to like kind of break that, that down. And so this is a stat that I found on the internet. I think it's one of those stats of the internet of things that like there's probably lots of different uh, projections. Uh, <laughs> this is one I found um, that there'll be 75 billion things by 2025. So that's 75 billion things with all of that electronics, wiring, PCBs, all of those minerals extracted uh, from the earth. <laughs> 
finding their way around some, somewhere, doing something. Um, but I think the good thing is that, that there's actually a whole way of approaches and guidance out there from the kind of the prototyping, the manufacturing. Um, a lot of people working around eco-design for a while. This isn't very clear, I'm afraid, um, but it's eco-design strategy uh, wheel developed by Delft University. Uh, and it really goes lots down to a component level, lots of different things that you can do in terms of thinking about reduction in material usage, how can you can um, extract things. And I think I came across also the better I IoT, which has almost a simple checklist as well. Uh, that does touch a bit on the sustainability as well as the, a lot around security of, of the devices. And I think the other side in, in design, and that what I would always say is, is, is don't be afraid to kind of get out and talk to, to humans or people as fast as possible and, and test it. Because often with sustainability, I found, is, is that gap between what you've designed and made and then how it's actually used sometimes means that even if you've done it in a great way and sustainable design, they don't, they don't use it in the right way or discard it and do unexpected things that you would never imagine them, them to do with it. So that's bringing in the human insight or that the, whoever's going to be using it as soon as possible. So my particular favorite area is around materials, um, as is Madonna, apparently. Um, <laughs> and there's a huge area and growth over the last since I've started really 10 years, are really around life cycle thinking and what we call circular design. In the 1970s, a guy called Walter Starhol uh, started talking about um, economic loops or loop economics, recognizing like this, this how can we keep on using um, materials in a finite planet? You know, we've only got so many, surely growth, this isn't going to work. A book was written called Cradle to Cradle, probably in early 2000, I read it at university actually, uh, that talked about instead of that cradle to grave design, so grave and waste, or you know, we, don't, we don't know what happens to it, is really thinking about how do you design a product that, that comes back to the cradle, is reused, uh, repurposed, modular. And more recently, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has kind of pioneered with big businesses getting more of this thinking on board around the circular economy. So that's, that's really just flipping that linear chain, but thinking about how do we then take it back, reuse it, repurpose it, manufacture it. Ultimately, taking responsibility for that kind of what is end of life, or when does that happen? And getting a bit more of a kind of complex diagram here, this is what they call the butterfly diagram in a biological and a technical cycle, where it really looks at lots of different ways that you might want to think about, well, first, how do I recycle? Whatever I'm making, how can I repair it? Thinking about modularity, what bit's going to be um, needed to be changed or fixed first? To kind of reuse maintenance aspects, design for service and design for longevity. And I think this is really where the Internet of Things is a really um, potential supporter in enabling a lot of those material flows, a lot of that information, a lot of understanding what needs to be repaired when. Uh, so around the circular economy, there's a, there's a big kind of growing area of interest around the use of it to support really material usage and flows. So really it is this kind of intelligent assets, a collision of data and, and, and products, whether before quite a lot of types of products might not necessarily had that, that ability or the data in them to really understand how they're used, how they behaved, what's, what's uh, working or not. Um, around the EU as well, there's a kind of a move to maybe products should have like a, a passport, a product passport, where throughout their life, you know, you can get that information about how it's made, where it's come from, and that ability to repair it as well. And I suppose that there's that switch, and maybe it's an enabler also, that instead of owning stuff, that you can go to a library of things and, and rent it or share it. Uh, one of the most kind of famous examples in the circular economy is around a, a drill. So if you've got a drill at home, likelihood is you probably use it about seven minutes in its whole life. You know, it's very <laughs> few, unless it's your job to do lots of drilling, maybe a few more people do more drilling actually here. Um, but actually, why would you own that product when actually, you know, it could be shared by a lot of people? But to do that, people like things to be convenient. They like to be able to access it fast. So, so potentially there's areas around the Internet of Things that enable that ability as well. There's also platforms, I just, I just put a bit, picture of my dog in, um, like 
borrow my doggy so you know you can actually kind of share other people's dogs and take them for a walk as well so there's a big growing um awareness of, of why own stuff when actually maybe you can share it or lend it and if you know where it is as well and then I suppose the other side, maybe moving on to the more the social ethical uh, side, Ooh, I'll just leave that on a bit uh, longer, is, is around how it's made, where it comes from. That stuff that's been out of sight uh, for a while. I really like this quote, and you know, we often see that with the fast fashion or whatever, when something's cheap, and I think you'll probably get that with some of those kind of little, probably some of the devices, you know, Ooh, that's a low cost price. Well, you know, sometimes as well, then who was actually paying for some of that uh, technology? And maybe that's down the supply chain as well. So there's, around that is also where data technology, um, a bit like that product passport, is it's a lot of kind of growth around traceability, accountability in, in supply chains and really understanding where stuff comes from and how it's made again. Ha who's heard of Fairphone here? Quite, quite a few, yeah. So they've been a, it was a Dutch startup, they've been around for a while. And um, what they really started off was looking towards where kind of conflict minerals or where some of those, those um, parts of a smartphone come from. They decided the best way to find out was to try and make one themselves, in which they crowdfunded, did really well. Uh, and what they found out was that it was impossible to find where it all came from. Because once you start going down into the supply chains, you're in Congo, you're in Kenya, and it's almost like impossible to actually find where the parts on a PCB or, or something like that come from. So they've actually spearheaded a group to really come together and, and kind of find out more about that. Um, I just read that they're really looking into lithium at the moment. So <laughs> lithium, it, it's in most of our batteries, um, lithium iron, all of these kind of things. But actually, they're really trying to trace the supply chain chain and understand where that comes from. In their second model, they also looked at some of those more circular design principles of the phone. So what could be modular? What's going to be the first thing that breaks? Maybe a camera, maybe this. What's going to be the, the next thing that needs upgraded? So how do we make the physical device that it can be changed quite easily without the whole phone um, being thrown away? And I, quite a few people might also uh, be involved in this kind of this growing movement around repair. We've got a repair cafe in Reading. Um, repair cafe, I think, started in the Netherlands. There's now hundreds of these types of things, or restart projects around the world, where actually it's like, how do we, people want to be able to fix um, more of their stuff again. <laughs> and there was a movement of, you know, that lock-in, but now actually, you know, why can't I fix my, my toaster? Why can't I fix my washing machine? Why can't I fix my phone? when all the big companies have often tried to like, design out the ability to fix it. Um, there's actually a growing movement around it to enable it again. And again, there's new EQ, EU uh, regulation coming in around making uh, repaired parts more accessible for longer and, and various things about that. Even Apple have slightly opened up and allowed you know, non-Apple repair centers uh, to fix some of their things again. I mean, they've been kind of holding back screens and everything to stop anyone else being able to fix it. So I think there is this kind of growing want and desire to, to kind of fix products. So to kind of summarize a few things um, that I've kind of learned to make things better, um, make things that are really needed, <laughs> uh, design things from that kind of life cycle perspective, think about what's going to happen to it after it's kind of on the market, um, modular, repairable, uh, I think there's quite a lot of good low, low energy um, products actually out there at the moment and thinking about how it could be renewable or recharged or things like that. Um, support enabling them to be kind of shareable and accessible. That's a lot about both the, that kind of the repair movement as well. But maybe when stuff breaks, is somebody else able to like repair it as well? And, and I suppose that touches a, on the role of open source or open design. And, and again, that kind of designing things collaboratively, involving different people or your users and, and elements like that from the start. Um, that was my talk. Thank you. <laughs>